You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Three, two, one. We are good to go. No, I mean, we can just continue right right where we left off there. Yeah, like the, the travel thing has gotten crazy because, um, you know, I wanted to fish and I might still fish the BFLs next year, but I got into kayaking during the COVID thing. And this is the second year I started to fish it. And it, it just makes more sense even from a financial standpoint. I pay 60 bucks. And last weekend, I got fourth place in big fish. And I think I, I pocketed 500 bucks off of a $60 entry fee. Like it, and I'm not paying for, like, if I took my boat to like Kerr, that's two to 300 bucks in just petrol for the boat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and, and I was driving back because, you know, my wife and I are, <laughs> are trying to get a house at some point and all this other stuff. And it's like this kayaking thing, it's just way more frugal. And then I just right. literally before our interview, I Google like, well, how much is the Hobie BOS? And I was like, oh my God, that's pretty cheap comparatively to everything else for a two day yeah. event. That's awesome. Yeah. Two two ninety five. Um, and then I believe, I want to say Bassmaster, the Bassmaster kayak series is right in the same ballpark as that. Um, and all their events this year are two day events as well. Um, KBF is still doing something. I don't, I don't fish KBF, but KBF is still doing something. I think it's two one day events on the same weekend. And I think they're like 110 a piece or something like that. And then I think they have an option that you can I, I don't know. There's a lot of stuff going on with that that I'm not aware of, so I don't want to speak on intelligently on it. But um, they're all over 200. None of them are over 300 at this point, though. Which so. I, I hope to kind of keep it right there. It's right at, uh, for our bo- for boaters that are listening. It's right at the BFL kind of price range, but you get to fish two days, which I really like. I think right. that gets you. You are a better angler over two days than one. You can always back into five good bites. On a yeah. one day, anybody, Two days. Can, anybody can strike luck. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I mean, <laughs> I looked at like Nolan, uh, Nolan minor. Um, and I follow like him on social. I've been talking to him a little bit about getting him on here. To, um, he did really well day one and his fish ran out day two. And it's yeah. just, he kept talking about like, yeah, it's just about those are the little chest chest moves you have to make. Um, I, don't know, I just find that so fascinating to me. Yeah. Uh, especially Nolan, Nolan and Ewing both are very high quality anglers. Um, Stop it. Okay. I got a dog that's crying. Um, but yeah, Nolan and Ewing both, I mean, they they have figured out a way to to be good consistently. <laughs> uh, well, they're, they're not completely human. I think they're mermaids or something like that. Yeah, they, they, they are one with the fish for sure. They, they are. I see them. I see them in upstate New York. And then a day later, they're in like the, the Gulf of Mexico chasing tuna. It's just yeah, they it's, are living the life. <laughs> they really are. But they seem like good dudes, man. Um, I've gotten to meet both of them. I, I know on the water, they're both, uh, you know, very respectful and, and considerate of others and everything like that. I have nothing bad to say about them. They're good people and they're great anglers. So how did you get into this whole kayak thing? Oh, I stopped playing golf because it was frustrating. <laughs> um, I stopped playing golf because it, because I was, I, I got down to a point where I was like a, I had like a nine handicap and I would go out and shoot a 90 and be just mad, just mad beyond belief. And my wife said to me at that point in time, she said, why do you go do this as a hobby if you're not having fun? And I'm like, I don't know. That's a good question. Maybe I need mm-hmm. to find a different hobby. So I went to, Bass Pro Shops, and of course, got my first kayak. I bought an Ascend FS12T. I took it out on a lake, and I was very close to quitting kayak fishing the same day. Um, I did not like the Ascend. My my butt was hurting. It was hard to paddle. And I said, uh, okay, well, I'm going to take this back to Bass Pro Shops, and I'm just going to call it quits. And I've always fished. I've always, you know, as a kid, I, I've, I've fished since I was, you know, old enough to walk. But um, I took it back to Bass Pro Shops and kind of down on myself a little bit. And my wife was like, well, why don't you go buy a different kayak? And I was like, well, they're really expensive. And she's like, how expensive? And I'm like, the one that I would want to get is like three grand. At the time, it was the Old Town Predator PDL. And she's like, just go, just go do it. 
I don't want you moping around the house. I don't want you at the house. Like I want you, <laughs> I want you to be gone. So um, I went and bought that. And after that, man, I never looked back. Um, it's still, that is still my favorite kayak that I ever owned. The Old Town Predator PDL. It, that is such an interesting, my story kind of follows that where I bought one from Dick's Sporting Goods. And I remember... I needed my, my help from my dad and my brother to get out of the thing after an eight hour float. Cause my toes, like I couldn't feel my toes or my legs. It was so miserable and my back was out and I just never wanted to do it again. And then finally, after two years of going back and forth, my credit limit was high enough on my credit card. And this was in college and I bought a wilderness. I think it's the radar, like one thirty five with mm-hmm. the pedal system. And Oh my God. It, from Dick Sporting Goods special to that, yeah. it was a Ferrari, and and it does it <laughs> makes a difference. It, it is <laughs> like my back felt better. I felt like I, I could stand up and do some things like I do in my bass boat, and it, it, it completely opened my eyes to what kayaking could be. Yeah, and, and you know, almost all the major brand of kayaks now, you know, between Hobie, Jackson, Old Town, you know, Wilderness, Bonafide, like. All of them have pedal drives. They're all good. Native is another one. Um, they're all good. They all have their ups and you know upsides and their downsides. But um, but they're all you know most of your fishing fishing level kayaks now are are up north of that three grand number. So it's still for like affordable when you know if you take it in terms of like bass fishing out of a bass boat yeah it's still way affordable way more affordable and i think that's why it's growing so quickly is because it because of that um but they are they're getting expensive and yeah that's that's what i'm worried about too is i think if i had to pick the two things that make kayaking that separates it from everything else it's you can get into water no one else can river floats things of that elk Mm -hmm. and it's cheaper yeah. But when you get guys, I think I think I saw Carl Jockamson, like he shit off a Hobie 14 that had like two graphs. Uh, it had down skin, 360. Like, like, yeah. Okay, that's that's almost $20,000 yeah. right there. So it, that's I, have, crazy. I have a video from um, Bassmaster Classic, not this year, but the year before. Um, I was working the booth down at the dugout bait and tackle booth there. And I was with Jeff uh, doing the Torquedo stuff. And I had a video of a $22,000 out the door kayak fully rigged. It had two Lowrance 12 inch graphs. It had live sight. It had a bilge pump. It had all the lights and everything, a motor. Um, and it wasn't even the highest end Hobie that was made. It was... It was like a base model Hobie Pro mm. 14. Like it didn't even have the 360 version of the, of the, so, I mean, there's, <laughs> there's people, I mean, before I sold my PA 14, I had a PA 14 360 and I had a Garmin 10 inch graph with live scope and a motor. I think my, my boat, I think was like, it, once I totaled everything up, it was like 15 or 16 grand. So, I mean, yeah. It, it's weird because I, I get it from the from the competitive side point. I completely understand it. If, if kayaking is your thing, do it. I, I just always think from the big picture standpoint, where does this go? Because, you know, on, on my show, you hear people complain all the time from the boat realm. Boats are $100,000. Everyone needs 30 graphs. People don't like where it's going, but then is kayaking going to go that way too? And it's like, that's learn the lessons from boating. I think Hope, the, um, the Hobie series is smart where it's like, okay, no electric motor. Yeah. Period. Boom. And that's, that's one thing. So I love, I love the fact that the Hobie is all human powered. Yeah. Um, I think that that, that puts a certain level of physicality into fishing that you have to be more than, more than a good fisherman to, to go out and, and, and consistently be good on the Hobie, on the Hobie series. Like you have to have that ability to pedal maybe eight, nine, 10 miles in a day. Maybe like you might have to do that to go find good fish and, and, you know, catch your limit on two, you know, two days in a row. Um, the, there are still people that are doing really well with the electronics. There's the live scope guys that can go out to the middle of the lake and sit on a grass flat. I think Ewing did that 
down at the Harris chain this year. And mm-hmm. he, he absolutely annihilated the field. Um, like he had, God, day one, I think he had like 110 or 115 inches of fish in his best five. Like, but, you know, but yeah, but like you said, the difference is, and this is why I think we, we both like it is everyone has the same thing. No matter what kayak you have, you can't have yeah. two or three trolling motors on it to where right. you can haul shot five spots. You have to pedal, you have to do something and you have to pick your area. Right. You, you have can't, to, throw, yeah. the, the thing about kayak fishing, I think most people, most people kind of overlook this. Like the, a, a, a typical kayak fisherman has to milk a spot for everything that it has. You know, because we don't we don't have that luxury to up and, you know, move 10, 5, 10 miles down a lake. When we pick a spot, we have to be there and we have to kind of sit there and, and figure them out. If they're not eating what we want them to eat, they probably, you know, they probably haven't left. Mm-hmm. But we have maybe we might have to wait them out. You know what I mean? I mean, our run making a run is maybe pedaling two miles away and that's going to take an hour and a half. We don't have that. You know what I mean? We don't have that luxury to, to move. So I don't want to call, you know, I know that you have a lot of boating, boating viewers and probably kayaking viewers. So I don't want to say that a kayak fisherman is better, but we have to adapt. Like we have to, we have to really milk a spot for everything that it has. Whereas the boaters typically don't do that, don't have to, because they can move. They can go someplace mm. else that has maybe biting fish or maybe something different. But when we pick a spot, we have to stick to it most of the time. Yeah. And it's not just about the kayaker. It's also about the individual. Because I mean, example is Ewing and Nolan. I mean, I, you put them in a bass boat, they probably would do the same thing. Th- those two are just, they're, <laughs> they're wired differently. They really are. It's funny that you say that. I, I don't have firsthand knowledge of it, but I know there's a lot of people that have been messing with Ewing quite a bit because um, he hasn't been doing nearly as good in the college boat world as he has been in the Hobie world. So they, they joke with him and say, man, put that kid on a kayak. He can catch fish. You put him on a bass boat. And he's it's like, he forgot. <laughs> so I know that there's people that have been messing with him. I don't have firsthand knowledge of it. I haven't been messing with him, but I know some folks have. Sometimes it's just the yips too. I mean, yeah. you know what I mean? I mean, it's a sport like golf or baseball and, and it could be something where, and I don't know about it, but from my experience in the baseball world, if it gets into his head that he can't catch him off of the boat all of a sudden, yeah. now you just, you just create the damn problem. Right. Um, but I mean, he can cry it with all the checks he's cashing on the Hobie thing. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't <laughs> it does. matter. I mean, I'm pretty sure he has a first and two seconds. Maybe I may, might even be more than that. Um, I think he has two first now, right? Or is it, yeah. wait, did, did he win at Cayuga or come in second? No, he came in second at Cayuga. Okay. Cause he won at Seminole. I think it's Seminole. He won at, mm, I'm right? not sure if he won. No, he won at the Harris chain. Um, I don't know. I haven't been following it super closely cause I haven't been fishing it this year, but I know that he's, you know, he, he's going to end the year probably with four top five finishes and we have a really solid chance at angler of the year again, again this year, he'll have a really solid chance at angler of the year. So that's just so freaking insane, but that's actually, you know what, this is why, well, I'll pull a, a Jamie, uh, let's see. I know, I know he won at Harris chain. I was there for that one. Caddo and Bistino, I believe somebody else had won. Oh my God. Yeah. He, he won. This is, this is Seminole. Is that Seminole? Yeah, okay. So, so he won the first two events of the year. <laughs> yeah. Or no, 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 no. He won. Okay. So yeah. So Seminole was the fourth event of the year because they went to Santee Cooper. How did he do it, Santee? Uh, let's go right to here. Hello. Where'd you go? There they are. Uh-huh. I don't know. Uh, let's see. We got Nolan got 33rd. Hmm. And said, he might've, it might've been at, he didn't fish um, that one. It might've been at the uh, Caddo and Bistino that he took second place or maybe 
I'm not, I'm not entirely sure, but I, I know I, I'm pretty sure he has two first place finishes and two second place finishes. Oh so. yeah. So, so we got Seminole. He's got a first Harris chain. He's got a first Cayuga. He's got a second. Cause I can just right. see him in the picture right here. Yeah. But I mean, still like that is damn, that is gaudy as anything. Yeah. And I, I think it put, I think there was a, a while ago there was, there was conversation about that, that kayakers, kayak anglers and, boat anglers who's better I, I think that's been put to rest with some of these sticks that you have now i really do well uh, i mean but it'll always be there one one thing that's kind of interesting is that they're they're crossing over you know they're they're doing both like you like you look at ewing and jackson or for instance both of those kids are in college to you know on bass fishing scholarships but they're fishing out of kayaks and destroying fields and they're probably eventually going to be on the elite series. Yeah, I don't. I, I, I've been thinking about that more and more, and I haven't come to an opinion on that because there are some people that hop over that are that are touring Bassmaster Pros to do the kayak thing. And I feel like it's not completely the same because you don't see kayak anglers. And I could be wrong. You know, let me know if I'm wrong. You don't see pure kayak anglers that make the hop over to the Bassmasters. You only see it the other way. I think it's because of sponsorship dollars and the sponsors telling them to do that, which well, I don't know how I feel about that. I, I, I think that, so one, one person I know that did it this year was Greg DePalma. And he um, won. And he won down at, oh uh, gosh. Um, Gunnersville. Gunnersville. Yeah. Um, you know, Greg is a, he's a, high quality bass fisherman on the elite series. He came out and he is sponsored by old town and you know, old town, Minn Kota and Humminbird are all part of Johnson outdoors. So Johnson outdoors is a huge sponsor of his. I don't think they pushed him to do it though. Hmm. I think from, from the limited conversation that I've had with Greg, it seemed like he was just generally interested in it because of the nature of what, of what we do. And it was made, you know, a lot more feasible for him because of course, being part of Johnson outdoors, it, yeah, everything is, he has everything that he could want, you know, between old town and Humminbird and the Minn Kota trolling motor system. Um, I think he does plan. He, I think he's planning on fishing a couple Hobies this year too. I'm not sure. I think I thought that he had planned on fishing Cayuga, but I was, may have been wrong, but That'll be interesting if you have Bassmaster professionals doing the Hobie series where the field again is like base layer. You gotta you gotta pedal to get out there and to see how they do. Cause if they don't it would just be interesting data. Like if they don't do well, what does that mean when it's like Lucanelli did it a couple years ago too? Yeah, and he did it well, yeah. Yeah. I think it was oh uh the upper bay, I think is where he uh he won. well he won on the upper bay. You know, and I don't want to take anything away from Iconelli because he's a great angler, but that event only had like 30 people. And that's and, his backwater. I mean, that's his, and, field and it's his I mean, yeah, it's where he, you know, he cut his teeth on tournaments yeah. fishing there. So, you know, I don't want to take away from him what he did, but to me, it was probably more impressive that he came out on the Susquehanna river and Lake Champlain. And I'm pretty sure he had top tens at those fishing out of his kayak. So to me, that was more impressive than him going to the upper bay and winning because honestly, I don't care if you put him in a, in a, you know, in a floaty tube, he should go down to the upper bay and win against anybody because yeah. that's where he cut his teeth tournament fishing. He probably has more waypoints on that body of water than anywhere else. So, but more, more power to him. Like he even Absolutely. said, like, I just, I want the trophy in the kayak thing. Like he just, yeah. that's one more thing he wanted. It's like, all right. Yeah. Yeah. Do you dude? that's awesome. And I'm, you know, I'm very happy. I'm, I, so I'm happy that it happens. I'm happy that the, that the professional anglers are crossing over into kayaking because in a way <clears throat> there's always been a, uh, I don't, there's always been kind of like a, this disconnect between the two, you know, you have your bass boat guys and you have your kayak guys. And a lot of times it's, in some instances, like they, it's like they, they're not showing the same, they're not showing us any respect. Like they'll come mm. in and fish and, you know, we'll be fishing some water and they'll come in and fish right in front of us. And I know they do it not only to it, to us, but they do it to each other too. We do it as well. We're not immune to it. Um, we have those people in our groups that do the same thing, but I've heard, and it has been said to me on the water, like you're, dude, you're just in a kayak. I'm, I'm fishing, a, I'm fishing a, a, a derby here and i'm like so am i 
<laughs> you know what I mean? But I've I've yeah. had that happen to me on on the Upper Bay and the Potomac both, where someone has come in and fit, started fishing, and I'm like, hey, like. But let let's unpack that. That's a fun conversation because you know you know the DMV, like the biggest body of water around besides the Upper Bay is probably the Potomac River. That gets the mm-hmm. most media coverage. All the yeah. tournaments there. And the one thing that I hear about from every person I've had on the show, every tournament organizer, organizer, is there's too much stuff put in at the same weekend. It's insane. Um, with like three weeks ago, you had the Bass Nation, then the Bass Federation, then the, the Tackle Warehouse, and then you had, I think it was another like massive team thing. It's insane. And so you have this crossover. And this is to where I think kayaking is kind of missing the beat. It's like, instead of going to Gunnersville, the Susquehanna is a no brainer. That's yeah. perfect. The new river, which I got a lot of coverage coming on that. That's amazing. Like mm-hmm. pick places that really just shine off your product. And I get sometimes you have to go to a place like that, but wh- Wait, why why compete with them if you don't have to? You have to you have to have the draw. Like you know, that's true. When when you look at the when you look at the fishery list of where we're going, you know, I know a couple of years ago they went to I want to say it was like Lake Winnipesaukee, New Hampshire. That's cool. And. It is. It's really cool. A lot of big giant fish live in that lake. And I know it's like it's on like one of the top 100 best lakes in the country right now, but it doesn't have the draw that Chickamauga or mm-hmm. Gunnersville have, right? So when you're talking about these, you know, trying to get people from outside of the region to come to it, you know, Champlain and Cayuga have the draw. But if you go I don't know, pick one of the other finger lakes. Is it going to have the draw? No, it's probably not. So they kind of have to, in some, some instances, go to some of these big name waters, but I agree with you 100%. Go into some of these not so popular places would be huge for kayak fishing as well as bass boat. I mean, go into some of these places that aren't, you know, televised on TV all the time would be absolutely awesome. Yeah. It, it, two examples of this, uh, one kayaking, one boating is the MLF when they went to North Carolina and those lakes right, right around there, I didn't hear them until they started pulling 10 pounders out of there. Yeah. You're talking they about did, Fall, Falls Lake. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then basically the kayak world, I really think put the Susquehanna on the map when you started having tournaments out of the Susquehanna. We, so we, I know for a few years we had been asking and begging like the Hobie BOS to come there. Um, but the issue there is the sponsor dollars. Mm-hmm. Um, the the most popular section of the river lies between Middletown, Pennsylvania and Sunbury, Pennsylvania. That's the most popular section of the river. That's where most of your trophy fish are being caught. Um, the problem with that is that the only major visitors bureau in, in that stretch of river is Harrisburg. And Harrisburg is combined with Hershey, Pennsylvania, where I live. Hershey Harrisburg Visitors Visitors Bureau does not want to give anybody money to come there. Mostly because Hershey doesn't need to. Hershey has all the attraction and they have the giant center. They have concerts every weekend. You know, they have big name people coming every single weekend to Hershey. And on top of that, they have the amusement park as well as other, you know, odd attractions around here. Um, they just don't want to give a tournament organization that might bring 200 anglers any money to come do it. And those tournament organizations need that. They need that sponsorship dollar. Yeah. I, and I, I, a hundred percent agree for so many places. That's why, but that's also why you get the Sabine where it's like, okay, who's going to catch a one pound bass today as they drive 200 miles, but the crowds are amazing. It's like, okay, I get, they paid you, but damn, yeah, it, like, I, you got to find a balance at some point, you know, I, I think a good balance is going to be that that new river, that Beckley, West Virginia. I think I think there will be some really cool limits caught there. That's um, fun. And I think it's going to be, you know, it'll be a nice tournament, but I think it's going to take just like for the Susquehanna. The first year we had it here, I think we had one hundred and twelve people. I don't think that the the new is going to get there to that because the new is daunting. Yeah. It is a daunting river. And a lot of people are going to look at that and be like, well, my $15,000 Hobie is not going to do well down there. You're right. <laughs> it's not. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So because of that, I think that the numbers will, will slack a little bit there. But, I mean, you could look at, you know, for instance, Falls Lake. Like if we went to Falls Lake before the Bass Boat World did, you know, before MLF went there, 
people would be like, oh my God, how are these kayak fishermen putting up 220 inches of, of bass over two days? I mean, we're talking like two 30 pound bags right there, you know? So no, I mean, but, that's, yeah, damn. No, you're right. About like the second year, because they they went there like two years in a row, correct? To the Susky. Yeah. Well, yeah. So Hobie came here. Um, and then Bass this year. I think. I want to say it was may have been three years now. Three years in a row we've come to the Susquehanna. Hobie's not coming this year, um, but Bassmaster is. Bassmaster is actually going to a section further up. Um, Bassmaster is going to their southern boundary is going to be basically Duncannon. And they're going to include stretches of the west branch of the Susquehanna as well as the north branch of the Susquehanna. Um, <clears throat> and the Visitors Bureau that they got involved there was, I believe, Sunbury Sealands Grove. So, and Sunbury Sealands Grove is the right place. Honestly, it's the right place to get involved because it's a smaller community. It's not like Hershey and Harrisburg. So I do believe that they, they probably went the right route there. It is interesting because it seems like based on what I'm I'm looking at, it's like after that first year, the the view of the Susquehanna changed. There was more views. There was people more Google searching it. Um, it seemed like there was a bigger draw in the tournaments. And honestly, mm -hmm. I think that's what's going to happen with the new is not a lot of people are going to show up this year, but this is the place that the state record smallmouth is caught. There are dinosaurs right. in there. And if somebody yokes a seven pound smallmouth the next year, I think there's going to be a bigger sign up. Yeah. Wait, wait till that 22 or 23 inch smallmouth get posted on one of those leaderboards and then watch and see if they come back the next year, how many people sign up, mm -hmm. you know, and that's really what it, what it boils down to. When people looked at the first year that the Hobie came here and, you know, I think 95 inches of smallmouth each day is what it required to win people were like, what? what? Those are, those are like great lake numbers right there. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then when you look at our fish, like our fish are not like the new river fish, the new river fish are kind of long and slender. Like our 19 inch fish might weigh four and a half pounds. Yeah. You can like get them study boys. <laughs> it's, it's kind of ridiculous. Um, actually the biggest fish the other day when I went with Jeff, whenever I caught those, I had my, three 20 inch fish and two 19 inch fish. One of my 19s was a 19 and three quarter inch fish that outweighed all the twenties. It was a 19 and three quarter inch fish. That was the heaviest fish I caught that day. Oh and I would gosh. say it was, it was absolutely pushing, if not over five pounds. Dude, that is awesome. Let me oh see. My gosh. Yeah. Yeah. T yeah. Text me a picture. And I can bring it up on the screen. Yeah. I'm the, going to right now. Cause Take that it. is and this is the other thing too. I say this on, on the show way too much is we live in the greatest area for river smallmouth fishing period. And I'll fight anyone on that because the, the tournament series you could have, you could start at the new river and then go to the upper James, then the Shenandoah, then the upper Potomac, and then the Susquehanna. Like that's, that's an insane amount of smallmouth river water in such a small area yeah. without, without major lakes cutting it off. And I mean, when you look at some of our lakes, even some of our lakes have good quality fish in it too. Oh yeah. So the first two fish was that 19 and three quarter inch fish that I caught. That was just absolutely giant. If I probably would have let her calm down, she probably would have settled in on 20 inches. And that would have been four 20 inch fish in the same day. Let's see what we got here. Use latest app. Do, do. But that was oh last. My God, these things are huge. <laughs> that was last week with when I I went out with Jeff. Um, Jeff struggled. <laughs> I don't want to talk about him today, but I mean, didn't Jeff just get back from like like California? <laughs> yeah, he did. Uh, and it was, so it's funny that you know in the morning, the morning time, he lost an absolute giant, and he's telling me about it, and he told me where he lost it, and what he was doing and I, I made a mental note of it and we went up river and fished and, and I ended up catching a lot of really good fish up river and we came back down and I came down around the corner and I was in front of him and I went to the spot where he lost that big one and I busted one that was almost 21 inches. Oh my God. <laughs> right in front of him. <laughs> and I asked him to come over and take a picture and I can see it written all over his face. He's like, yep. Yeah, I'll come take your picture. <laughs> and I don't know if you can see in the one photo that I sent you that he took, I was laughing. <laughs> it was, it was that one.
<laughs> but yeah, he he. Uh, <laughs> that is a freaking. That's a monster, dude. That yeah. and the coloration on that thing is just beautiful. That one all that was almost twenty one inches. And it just, I mean, our fish are just built so different. Like the big giant shoulders on them. Um, yeah, they're, they honestly, they're like great lake smallmouth that live in a river in two foot of water most of their lives. So how, how is the Susquehanna fishing right now? <laughs> Fantastic. I mean, you know, right now we're dealing with a little bit of a post spawn funk. It's hit or miss on the day. But what I will say is that the fish um you, we're seeing a lot of really big fish caught this year you know a lot of 20 plus inch fish caught this year um i've known some 22s have been caught some 20 a lot of 21s have been caught but the the fish you know from you remember 2018 when we had floods all year like it was i don't think the river got below 11 feet that year really bad high water year yeah, yeah. um there was i you know there was a downturn after that. And I think that that was because there were a lot of fish that died. Um, that, you know, that kind of water level all year long, just, I, I think it stressed them out. And a lot of those older fish had died. And, you know, in years after that, you would see a lot of 18, 19 and some twenties caught, but rarely were you seeing the 22s and the 21s. And now, those fish that were younger that weren't as stressed out as the, you know, the older fish were during that time frame. those fish have now grown up and are now, you know, high populations of them in the river system right now. Um, you know, there's a lot of big fish being caught. Um, there's, there's, there's still a lot of numbers too, which is nice. There's a lot of, I've seen a lot of small fish this year that I haven't seen in years past which means that, you know, there's been a couple of really good spawn classes. Um, I was talking to one, someone from the state uh, fish and boat commission, they were out doing some electro fishing and they were projecting that like 2024 through 2026 was going to be absolutely epic because of the, the spawn classes that we've had. And they, they, they're predicting good things for the future. That's, that's yeah. awesome to hear. Cause I just know. So, I grew up literally like right at the base of the main San the Shenandoah River. Now I'm in Williamsport, Maryland, right on the upper Potomac where the Conakajig comes in. So river smallmouth are in my blood and, and those high water events guys, for the ones that don't know, they're a death sentence. It, it not only like distorts, you know, the whole ecosystem, the habitat, but it also messes up spawn classes. And for like the Shenandoah, I think we had like four or five years in a row of high water and it completely messed us up. My wife walked in and I asked her to get me a cup of iced tea. <laughs> oh, you're good. That was my thought. Oh, yeah. So, like, um, yeah, for, for, like, the Susquehanna, if, if you had to do a report right now, then, like, wh what is it fishing like in July? Um, is it, are, are we getting into those summer flow rates? And, and honestly, this is a question I always like to ask for my river guys. What is a summer flow rate for the Susquehanna? So we're, we, we have been um, at, a, at a summertime flow rate for probably the last month. Um, it's, you know, it's at around three and a half is typically what it's been kind of hovering at three and a half feet at the Harrisburg gauge is indicative of summertime. Um, but we got there early. We got there way earlier than, than in years past that, you know, that I'm, that I'm used to, um, the, the three and a half foot is can be really tough to fish even in a jet boat. A lot of jet boat guys can't put their boats on the water at three and a half feet um, if they're not, you know, a high, highly skilled jet boat driver because there's limited places that they can run and those places that they can run are the same places that people float through with tubes and kayaks and everything else like that. So um, <clears throat> I would say as, as, a, as far as a fishing report goes and, you know, the next few months, well, right. The top water bites turning on. Okay. The top water bite is absolutely turning on right now. Um, but I, I think that probably the, the more consistent bite right now is like a wake bait, a really shallow diving crankbait. The most consistent bite right now that I'm, that I'm getting is the shallow diving crankbait, um, wake bait and fluke is, is the biggest, the biggest things that are getting eaten right now. 
And I say that having just busted a huge bag of fish on a spinner bait. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, throw a wake bait, but I killed it on a Senko. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> so the, the, the day that we were out fishing was, was very, very overcast. We had some rain and it was just a really, just kind of like a shisty day. Um, I needed that spinner bait for some flash that day on a day like it was today that spinner bait is going to be pretty worthless cuz low clear water like all that flash they they typically aren't you know aren't really interested in it cuz they can see it coming from a really long ways away um so you know a day like today would have would have je- definitely been that fluke crankbait bite would have prevailed um and I know that the fluke has been catching them too and that's what Jeff had lost that really big fish on was a 7 inch fluke Mm -hmm. Um, I came through and that was the only fish that day that I came through and and caught on the wake bait. Um, I I say it was that fish. I don't know if it was that fish or not, but that spot was holding big fish. And I came through later that day and caught a a fish out of the same place where he lost the big one. And when I say Jeff lost a big one, Jeff told me that was the biggest fish I've hooked up on in quite some, so many years. For Jeff Little to say that, that was a big fish. That was a big fish because Jeff consistently catches big fish and he knows how big river smallmouth are typically before he mm-hmm. gets them in his boat. Um, you know, he lost the giant. And I'm going to have to have Jeff back on again to explain the story too. Give oh, both yeah. sides of it. <laughs> Don't ask him about this story. <laughs> He's, I, he didn't, you know, he was so happy for me. Jeff's a mentor of mine. Mm-hmm. Um, he was so happy for me because I had an absolutely epic day of smallmouth fishing, but I could tell in, in his, you know, in his mind, he was thinking, man, I really wish I would have gotten to that spot first. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so, you know, we, Jeff and I fish a lot together and very, very few times do I best him. The days that I best him, I kind of savor a little bit. How did you two meet? Oh, uh, my wife is smiling at me and laughing. It was a Tuesday night at a movie theater. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, that's that is. So, <laughs> so I asked Jeff to to help me install my torpedo, and he told me no. <laughs> um, and after that, I I took it to a guy, or no, I didn't do. Did I, I take it? It was Trey. Yeah, then I went through Trey Leach with Innovative Sportsman. And then that's basically how I I got connected with Jeff. And and now um <laughs> now Trey and Jeff and I are all really close friends. But one thing that's fun that you never get to see in Jeff's YouTube videos because when Jeff goes to Trey's house to film and I'm there, Trey and I we make Jeff's life almost hell. Because <laughs> We joke and do things. And there's been times where, where Jeff's got the camera in his hand and and, which is very rare. The only time Jeff has his camera in his hand is when we're not on the water. When, when he's on the water, I have a camera in my hands filming him typically. Um, but we, we, we go to Trey's house and Jeff will sit the camera down and be like, guys, I've got to be home in like three hours. I really need you all to stop acting like children so i can finish this video <laughs> we uh i want to see jeff flustered that'd be amazing oh <laughs> if there's anybody that can do it it's me and dre i promise you <laughs> dre and I have, we have figured out a way to antagonize jeff little and, and it's fun and he enjoys <laughs> i think he enjoys it. oh my god yeah you three need you three need to be in more videos together most of the videos that we're in together are heavily edited. <laughs> so, so I, I got a funny story about Jeff. I hope he doesn't mind me telling this. Um, so typically when we go out filming, when we go out fishing, I'm, I'm there filming him doing something because he's probably one of the greatest teachers in fishing. Um, and you know, it's, it's a lot easier when someone else is behind the camera and you can, kind of teach that person as you're, you know, as you're filming, whatever you're filming. So 
when Jeff doesn't run his cameras and someone else is filming because I too have a YouTube channel, um, Jeff forgets the, the, um, like about, you know, just say cursing, right? Jeff will sometimes drop bombs on my YouTube video and I'm like, what? Like, now I got to edit out that whole thing. He's like, oh man, I forgot my bad. And I'm like, oh dude, come on. Like sometimes, sometimes he makes it hard for me. Oh my goodness. That is freaking awesome. All right. Yeah. I'm making a note. I got to get you three on the podcast together and just tell stories that that's got to be freaking. You're going to have to label that one rated R my friend. Uh, We'll do the after hour special. (laughs) That one's, that one might not be able to be YouTube appropriate. (sighs) That's freaking awesome. not getting monetized on that one. Ah, well it's still, (laughs) it's still, it's worth the stories and the memories. How, How did you get into the YouTube thing? Was it through Jeff? Um, you know, he was probably the, the biggest motivator of it, but he never told me to do it. Um, I saw what he was doing. I saw it as a, as an opportunity to, you know, highlight something on about this river because our, our river doesn't have many people that run video for, you know, for YouTube purposes. I think I'm one of maybe one or two people on this entire river system that have a YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. Um, Jeff, you could say Jeff's YouTube channels on this river, but Jeff's YouTube channels all over the place, like coast to coast, north to south. I mean, Mexico, Canada, California, like these are all places that he's been in the last year and a half. So, you know, Jeff's videos aren't really cer- um, centered on the Susquehanna. I think I might be the only person on the Susquehanna that has a YouTube channel. I don't want to say ded- dedicated, but almost dedicated to the Susquehanna. Um, it's, so, it, it's hard because I really feel like calling it a river almost does it injustice for how big the damn thing is because it's huge. I, I have so many people like, come, you know, ask me to do a monthly fishing report on this place. Like I do every other body of water in the DMV. The problem is it's so big. You'd have to break it up into sections because yeah. it's not all going to fish. It's its own ecosystem. The Juliet is one section and you have down to where, you know, the lake is. It's just, it's insane. Yeah, the, I, I wouldn't even I wouldn't even be able to include the Juniata into the Susquehanna River fishing report um, because the, the Juniata is absolutely its own amazing fishery. The Juniata is an, mm. an amazing fishery, um, especially certain you know springtime of the year. Oh my god! Like the fish that get caught out of the Juniata are just just gross, grossly fat. But um, you know, you could you could easily say that between Sunbury and you know the Conowingo, there's probably six to eight different sections of a, what you would consider a fishing report. Isn't that crazy? It, it, That's it's, just it's, so cool. <laughs> yeah, it's it's wild, and you know, the river changes so so much within that stretch. You know, it'll change and then go back, and then you know, you have some deep water and then it's nothing, you know, but four miles of shallow nothingness, but there's still giant bass that are there. Um, you know, it, it would be very difficult to give a blanket fishing report for the Susquehanna river past the spring. You know, once once you get past the spawn, it would be incredibly difficult. Yeah, it, it is such a cool place and people are so tight lipped about it. And then you on top of it, like we just talked about the size of it. It, it, it is it is so cool that what you're doing. And then on my other monitor here, I have your channel up and dude, yeah, you've been getting after it. Um, I got a few I got a few videos. I think the last time I looked, I want to say it was over 100 videos. Uh, um, well, dude, you're well over that. You're at 175. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's um. It's fun, man. Like I, you know, I want to say I initially kind of started it, like I said, with Jeff's motivation, but I also thought to myself like, Hey, you know, if I do this, um, dogs, do you, do you both want to die? You can't be in the podcast. Okay. Um, what was I saying? Mm. Oh, so I, I, I kind of started it with motivation from Jeff, um, but I also thought to myself, like, this would be a cool way to get my kid interested mm-hmm. in fishing. Um, that failed. 
not his his YouTube watch history is much more gaming related and not fishing related, but I it's slowly starting to work. <laughs> like he he wants to get out and do some stuff because he's now seeing some of the you know the fun that I'm having with it. Um, so, but that was kind of like the goal behind it. And then once it, you know, once it took off and once I got over that thousand subscriber mark and I started making money, I was like, wait, this is, yeah, this is kind of cool. Like you whopping 10 cents per video, but you're like, I mean, yeah, honey, yeah. we're retiring. <laughs> I mean, it, Hey, it's paying for, you know, if it's paying for gas to go fishing, then yeah. it's, it's serving a purpose. Um, but yeah, like that's. Now it's kind of transitioned where I'm trying to, you know, trying to make a little bit of money off of it, but I don't want to lose the authenticity of it. Like I don't, I'm not taking products from sponsors and doing that kind of crap. That's like, yeah. They don't, um, they don't prep you for that. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I don't, I, if, if the, if the right people came by and said, Hey, we would like to pay you some money to put our products in your video. I would have had to have already been using their products. Mm-hmm. So if Z-Man or River to Sea or Bill Lewis want to come and start throwing Jake some money, sure, I'll put some money. I'll put some money in my pocket and promote your products because those are products that I use quite often, especially on this river. And link in the episode description to his email so you can uh, reach out to him. Give him that money. <laughs> I, so I'll, I'll give you. I'll give you a tidbit. That's it's you know if anybody watches this podcast for next year. The Bill Lewis MR6 and MR12 were huge players this spring. Wow. Huge players this spring. That's going to be a hot tip right there. The MR6 was especially that crankbait catches fish. Like, especially in the shallow river, like six feet is not shallow here. Mm -hmm. Six feet is deep here. I'm really depressed. I'm not going to ICAST this year. I'm going to have to go next year since we're doing the whole house thing right now. I'm trying to figure that out. So, but just to see some of these new products and thinking about which ones translate um, back to here, it's just, it's so much fun. Um, is there anything in particular then that bait wise in the transition to top water that you like? Um, it's that it's the wake bait. For just sure. wake bait. Um, I, I really like a wake bait in that time where they're not quite eating top water yet. Um, wake bait and the fluke. But I also, uh, you know, I, I like to throw a spinner bait kind of like a little bit top water ish. So burning I, it. Yeah, I'll take a spinner bait and, and get I like to get bigger blades and get them fluttering across the top. Like some big willow blades fluttering across the top really, really does well on a nice cloudy day. Um, but the fluke for sure. And the wake bait is, uh, you know, the wake bait's kind of like the unsung hero lately. That Not a lot of people are talking about it. And then probably a lot of people are going to be mad at me that I am talking about it. Um, you know, that subsurface one foot crankbait that just, you know, wiggles its way through the water mm -hmm. column whenever they're not quite eating top water. Um, it's been a huge player for me so far. This it, it's so interesting how that stuff goes in cycles because, you know, I've seen on other people's channels and things how like the wake bait for smallmouth is a hot thing that no one talks about. And there was, there was a hot minute where Nolan made this stupid like spider thing, uh, a thing on the river. Like it, I really think it comes down to like what the fish don't see and like the spinner baits coming back because on the, like say the tidal Potomac, everyone's been throwing a chatter bait for the last 250 years. So they haven't seen a spinner bait. Um, it's so interesting how quickly fish can get conditioned to a certain technique, especially smallies. You know, I, I'm a, I'm a big fan of the trap down on the Potomac yeah. like, because, because of how much the chatter bait gets played out. Um, I did. I we had a tournament down there at the end of April, and I didn't. I don't think I threw a chatter bait at all. I put a trap in my hand and mm -hmm. caught fish all day long. I didn't catch any big fish, but I caught fish all day long on a trap. I'm not going to no. talk about the kind it, of trap, but I yeah, I mean, <laughs> that, I mean, that's in the background. That's how I paid my bills is on a trap on, on yeah. the Potomac because I mean, I mean, to each their own. But just like you said, like people weren't throwing it. And, I, and yeah. I think that, I don't know, I really, in my mind, I think smallmouth get pressured, get conditioned quicker than largemouth. I just think largemouth are a little bit dumber than smallies, but that's just my, my personal hot take on that. I uh, think for, in, 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 you know, for the river systems, 
they see so many things coming by them that if if it's something that they've seen a hundred times, they're probably unlikely to to mess with it. And you know, I I feel like it's easier to to know where that small mouth is going to be rather than where that large mouth is going to be. So you know, these small mouth are seeing a lot of baits all day mm-hmm. long in the summertime. They've seen a lot of whopper ploppers. That twenty one inch fish that I caught with Jeff has seen, you know, oh, three thousand whopper ploppers. But it was, might have been the first time that it's seen a DT Fat One in a few years. So, and it's seen a lot of flukes too. That's why you got to keep adjusting, and that, and that's why honestly, when it comes to like the hot bait guys, you just get out there and experiment. I mean, you if you have a couple of rods, throw a couple of different things. I I, I truly think it's not the bait; it's the area. Especially when I interview three or four people that fish the same tournament, and it's it always comes down to like they were in the right area with the right fish, like. Yeah. It, it's just so fascinating to me how important that is regardless you can have the right bait but if you don't have the right caliber fish it doesn't mean jack squat it really right. doesn't 100 percent agree 100 percent agree what was the other thing i was going to ask you about oh um here here's a fun topic flatheads <laughs> yeah hmm. let's go mm-hmm. calmly saying with the flathead situation here do you everything is going to reach an equilibrium you think so I want to hope because what's the other alternative? So here's what I foresee happening and I, and I'm seeing it happen slowly. It's not going to happen fast. Um, what's happening here. And, and I'm going to, hopefully you don't have a lot of flathead fishermen that watch this because they're gonna I already really get death threats all the time. It they're going to be really, really upset with me. Um, they are invasive to this river system because this river system is not capable of holding them for a long period of time while still holding other fish. The, the, they were not, na- they're not native here. I know the Susquehanna is, you know, the smallmouth are not native either, but the smallmouth have been here a whole heck of a lot longer. And the ecosystem has adapted, but we're talking about years and years and years and years. In the scheme of things, the flathead population is growing so so quickly and these fish are getting so big so quick that they are overpowering certain sections of the river Mm -hmm. certain sections of the river where you're not seeing big schools of bait fish anymore certain sections of the river where you're where you don't you won't see any sunfish there's none there's none between the flatheads eating them and the flathead fishermen coming out to catch them to go use them um you're not seeing sunfish i've I've not caught a rock bass in three years and i fished the susquehanna almost three days a week consistently throughout the summer what i don't understand is i have had on this show everyone in the maryland dwr i've had a bunch of people in the virginia and no one can tell me what the difference is in the estuaries or or the ecosystems that flathead originate from let's say the mississippi chain and here mm-hmm. example is the new river and i've had that why is it in the new river they're native there's no problems but why is it susquehanna none of them have given me a straight answer of like why that is and that's like know. it's so perplexing that no nobody knows why some places it works and some places it doesn't and that's just interesting yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. But I what I can tell you. So what I can tell you is this. Right. So I, I see the, the sections below like Middletown going down to almost, you know, to the Conowingo where the flathead populations are so vast and they're getting so big. That's where the state record continuously gets caught over and over each year, sometimes twice a year. The state records mm-hmm. being caught. We're talking 60 some pound flatheads that are being caught. Nothing is eating that fish. Nothing is is preying on that fish, right? That fish is is the apex predator. And they spawn very successfully because of that. So there's, you know, even their their spawn classes are, are doing really well because anything that comes in the bed of a 66 pound flathead is going to die. Yeah. That fish is going to open its mouth and probably inhale some of things that they weren't going to inhale, but, um, this river system, I don't think can, can handle a, an explosion of flathead like it can an explosion of smallmouth because smallmouth are going to eat for sure, but 
the flatheads eat everything, everything, every single thing. Um, you know, the, the smallmouth and the flatheads, I think one of the biggest times where, where flatheads are eating smallmouth is during high water events too, because hmm. now they're occupying the same areas and same, same stretches of the river. You go into those high water, you know, those high water refuge spots and you're catching 18, 19, 20 inch smallmouth with flathead bite marks on them. They're not eating them to kill them. They're not eating them to eat them. They're eating them. They're putting them in their mouths to say, get the heck away from here. Like this is my territory. Um, if you look at, if you look at the, the common wintering holes in the river, especially say around Fort Hunter, um, Fort Hunter now is like a catfish destination in some of those deep holes of just below mm. the mini Statue of Liberty. Hold on one second. Sarah, you need that water to be running? If you do, we can wait. I just, it's, I know it's creating some background noise. If you need it, we can wait. Oh, I'm getting the eyes. That's so much better. I can also clean it up in post-production. All right. Um, Fort Hunter is, is basically becoming flathead. I mean, just territory. Like the, the deep holes where those fish would winter up there, they're not, the smallmouth are not there anymore. They're still there, but they're not there in the numbers that they were in the past. If, you, if you've winter fished the Susquehanna recently, in the last year or so, you're seeing these fish in places that you haven't caught them in years prior because they're not in the apex wintering hole. They're not in the, the best wintering hole. The flatheads are. Um, and I think another thing that's bad in terms of catfishing and stuff like that, you're having a lot more catfish tournaments and these guys are bringing the, the fish back to weigh them. So I watched it happen this spring where there was like a 40 or 50 boat flat, uh, catfish tournament that went out of city Island and all of those guys came up river and a lot of, well, I shouldn't say all, a lot of those guys came up river and went into the Fort Hunter pool and then took, you know, five or how many ever fish they weigh. They each took giant catfish down to city Island and released them. So city Island has a whole heck of a lot of catfish now. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think that should be happening. I, you know, if you're going to, if you're going to do these tournaments like that, you know, I know for the bass tournaments on the Susquehanna, it's catch way release, release them with wherever pool you yeah. caught them out of. But, you know, they put, um, they put a lot of big catfish into the city Island pool just this spring by moving them from, you know, a few miles up North that they probably shouldn't have done that. But I, yeah, I just, and I've had people on both sides of the debate on the show before, um, trying to be as, as neutral as possible and letting everyone, you know, speak their mind on the subject. The problem is, and, and this is what, uh, Przinsky said at the Virginia DWR, it's like, what's the alternative? You know, we, we poison the river, like drain the river completely. Like you can't li like. And, and I, it's cynical, but he's right. There's nothing you can do at this point, right, to get them out of there. So, unless it is extremely drastic. So here's here's the. I mean, it's not it's not extremely drastic yet, but it's it's going to be, it's going to be. Um, I, I in you know five to ten years, I don't know what this world class smallmouth fishery is going to look like. Um, if they don't try to do something to limit the i don't want to say spread it encourage people to keep them right you know if you go to a farm pond that has giant largemouth bass in it right and five ten years later you go to that same farm pond and those fish aren't there but you're catching just a bunch of skinny just you know sickly looking fish it's because they've become overpopulated and they've outgrown the food source mm -hmm. that's what's going to happen in this river you're seeing it with the bait fish. You're seeing it with the pan fish. Um, even with the crawfish, you know, the crawfish populations were, you know, used to be able to go out there 
and look down at the bottom of the river and it looks like the bottom of the river is moving. That's not happening anymore. Right. You know, very rarely. And are you, is anyone reporting that? I've heard that once in the last three years. Whereas before, if you went out there, you, you know, you're like, holy crap, look at the amount of crawfish. You're not surprised anymore when you look and see because they're not there. Um, but what do they, what they really truly need to do is they need to encourage people to keep them. Um, and if they do some electro fishing, I don't know if it's possible, but I mean, why not take some of them out if they're invasive, if they found a snakehead during electro fishing, what are they going to do to the snakehead? Mm -hmm. I mean, they're, they're probably going to take it out. Right. Yeah. It, it, I don't know. Cause like I, I I've talked to David Sikorsky of the Chesapeake Bay association. We talked about the blue cat situation and what they're trying to do with the calling of them. And I, I want to see the data first. See, does that even work? Like, are we even electro fishing enough of them to, or should we just do supplemental stocking of crayfish and bluegill and, and rock bass? Or should that be the way we go? I, I don't, I don't know if that's the answer. I don't know if that's, yeah. I don't know what the answer is. All I know is that if, if they don't, if they don't start doing something, maybe stopping the promotion of these giant predator fish, because every time that someone catches one, they're celebrated on social media, mm -hmm. like stop celebrating it. You know, if, if, a, if a, I don't want to say stop selling guide licenses to catfish boaters, because that, that would be discriminatory, but like there's, there's catfish guides now out here on this river. And that's not something that we've had in years past. That's, I mean, sure, that's something that you have on the Mississippi and some of those rivers that are, you know, historically known for giant catfish. But that's not something that we've historically had on the Susquehanna. Like, I, I don't know what the answer is, but I know we have to we have to do something because, you know, they're they're hurting more than just smallmouth. They're hurting every other fish that's in this river. You know, I mean, because when you're eating the bait fish. And the bait fish are leaving because you're, they're they're getting you know just decimated by sixty pound flatheads. You're hurting all the other fish in the river. So I don't you know you can't tell people a state organization can't tell people to kill fish, mm -hmm. but they should encourage them to be kept. In some instances, um, you know, snakeheads. I'm completely opposite on snakeheads. Like I love snakeheads. I don't think snakeheads do anything to hurt the bass population even a little bit, but. I, I, don't, I don't think they're an issue either. And again, just looking at the data and stuff. And again, I guess the hardest part is too, it's, it's, oh, it's so layered. And that's, what's so interesting. Like even from the guiding service where some people will be like, listen, the bass population's down. And so I need to go start guiding for snakeheads and blue cats because I need to, have customers and then it, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy because then you're doing more guided trips for those and then then it raises their popularity and blah 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 right. and i don't know i just wish to me i feel like the the how you solve this issue is people got to figure out why is it in the new river and the mississippi it works and how can we replicate that at this point point? and i think the biggest thing is probably because there's shad in the mississippi thing and you have a ton of yeah. forage yeah, I think um, the for I mean the forage in the in the Mississippi is nowhere close. Like you, you couldn't even compare that to the what's in the Susquehanna. Um, the new, I don't have enough knowledge of the new to. to neither do I. <laughs> um, I don't know if the new has bait fish populations like that, but I would I would guess and say that there's there's so many. I don't know. There's so many small fish in the new. I don't know. I, it's, I don't know it's crazy, it right? There. I don't know why it works there. It, it makes no sense. It shouldn't make sense. It's not the same as the Susquehanna. It's not, no, it's it, but not. it works. It, and somehow, I mean, it works for them. I, I don't know, but I know that if you fish below Goldsboro pool, all the way down to the Conowingo, the bass fishing is not great, but the cat fishing is amazing. Which is sad because I believe the Maryland state record smallmouth came out of Conowingo, if I'm not mistaken, way, way back in the day. Probably, yeah. I would guess, I would say, yeah. Out of looking at all the Maryland, I mean, the upper Potomac could maybe give it a run for its money. But <laughs> I mean. She's gone now. We, we, yeah. Susquehanna, 
Yeah, because like we have like I'm I'm literally I can walk to Dam Five, and that's where a guy a bunch of guys got busted like eight years ago for dumping flathead, and now Dam Four and Five have flathead, and the main stem of the Upper Potomac until the Great Falls line has flathead in it, but the Shenandoah doesn't because there's a dam that's blocked right. it. So so far the Shenandoah doesn't, but yeah, and I know you go down there, yeah, there's no bluegill, and mm-hmm. it it blew my mind until I actually had a, a flathead guy on here and I didn't realize that you're catching live bluegill. And then all of a sudden it's like, it's not just the flathead that's destroying the population. That just, it, it was a light bulb that went off in my head when I heard that. <laughs> it, so I actually saw it the other day. Um, the other day I was out and I saw these guys that were out with, you know, bobbers and little ultralight poles. And I'm like, I'm looking at them. It's kind of like, what the heck are they fishing for here? And then, they were fishing for, you know, bluegill. And I'm like, they're not even fishing in the river. So they're taking fish from, Mm -hmm. you know, a local farm pond because that's where you can catch bluegill, right? There's a little pond down the street from my house that I see, you know, guys down there with catfish logos on the back of their truck down there catching bluegill. It's, they're not just hurting the river. They're hurting, Mm -hmm. they're hurting a lot of things. And that's where I think that's something I've even thought of and to, to our local state governance here is allow the selling of bluegill bait, something like that to help alleviate it. Cause it's like, people are going to be doing it. You might as well legalize it just so that we can kind of counterbalance them out. But that's a whole conversation for another day. I don't yeah. want to, I don't want to leave, I don't want to leave on a dire note like this. Um, what do you have coming up with your social media? Do you have any new YouTube videos or are you going to be cameramanning for Jeff in the Amazon or something? So, yeah, I wish. Um, so I, I have a, I have about a month worth of backlog on my YouTube stuff. Oh, wow. Um, so lucky <laughs> working full time fishing a lot. Um, I've ran out of time to edit these videos. So um, I'm going to be, I'm going to have some stuff coming out for this month. It's going to be coming out in July and then for the rest of the summer, I mean, I'm mostly going to be fishing on the Susquehanna. I have a Delaware river trip coming up. Um, but you know, a couple, a couple of local tournaments, but almost everything is going to be geared towards the Susquehanna. One thing that I want to try to do, and, and even though it's kind of foolish of me to do this, but I'm fishing this tournament, the end of October, there's a, the Bassmasters coming here to the Susquehanna. And I'm going to try to highlight some areas in that stretch that that's going to be in play. So I'm going to expand a little bit into the North branch and West branch this year with the YouTube channel and just kind of show some of those areas. Um, but outside of, I mean, it's mostly just going to be, I would say in the next few months, Susquehanna topwater fishing. Like there's going to be a lot of topwater, you know, videos coming out. There's going to be, some spinner bait videos coming out and hopefully the river levels play nice and make it where it's easy to fish for them. I, I wouldn't mind a four foot, four foot, four and a half foot river with some stain would be great all summer. Yeah. That would be banging. Actually, yeah. if we could get that down here. Do you work for Chiquito or, or what do you, what no. do you do for a living? I'm actually a federal police officer. Oh, nice. Okay. So I work, um, in a 14 day pay period, I work seven days cause we work 12 hour shifts and then the other seven oh, days. Gosh. Fish. So dude, that's brutal though. <laughs> yeah. It's worth it though. Like, I mean the, the, the fishing schedule is certainly awesome because of the, the amount of time that I don't work. So I would rather work 12 hour shifts and go less days cause that's more days I can fish. Oh, good deal, sir. And then guys, as always, link in the episode description, everything we talked about, including his YouTube channel, give him a subscription. Um, you know, he's probably going to be the next up and coming star that Bassmaster is going to interview for the the deets on the Susky every time they come here. I hope not. Um, dude, <laughs> is, there, is there anything else you want to promote or anything else you, you want to bring attention to? Um, yeah, just one thing. Um, so there's a new boat that hit the market this year. It's made by Innovative Sportsman. It's an inflatable kayak. And I know Jeff's been pushing the inflatable game for a while, um, but this boat is a river fishing machine. Um, he has it out right now, the Osprey. It's called the Osprey 1436. It drafts about three to four inches of water. It, When you hit rocks, it doesn't make noise. Um, it's fast. You put in a motor on it and you can go, 
you know, oh a long ways with it. It's a, yeah, right there it is. It's a, it's a blank platform that can, you know, absolutely be done whatever you want to do with it. You can move that seat up. You can put two seats on it. Um, it's a, just a very unique and fun watercraft that is unlike any other inflatable that's made because most inflatables are made to be lightweight. This one is made to be durable, a durable fishing platform. The side pontoons have um, two layers of fabric of the 1000 denier fabric. The bottom has a 1000 denier extra layer on top of that, on top of the regular layer. So it's a little heavier than most inflatables, but it is designed to be durable, to be used in shallow, rocky river environments that are going to be, you know, relentless. Um, it's, it's a pretty awesome watercraft. I'm, I'm in love with mine, with the, you know, the amount of ground that I can cover in the areas that I can get into that other broto molded boats can't float through. Um, you're not drafting very much water at all. And it's super quiet. It's very stealthy. That's actually a prototype boat that he's standing up on there. Um, that was, we were in prototype testing for about a year and a half before oh, they wow. finally released it. So it's had a lot of R and D. And then guys, if you want an even also more in-depth video, um, we interviewed Jeff Little last year at iCast with, with this. It's a really cool, it's a really cool setup. Hopefully someday I'll be able to get one of these things. Um, cause it is the perfect river setup. It, it, by far it is. It's just, it's legit. It really, it really looks good. Throw a little tidbit of information out there. They're coming out with a 12 foot version too. Hmm. That actually might be able to fit in the car. That might work. Okay. <laughs> there's, there's one on the roof of my vehicle right now. <laughs> <laughs> because that thing is big so yeah that that might that that probably will sell quick it's i think the 12 foot version is going to sell more than the 14 foot but the 14 foot has a very unique purpose that people shouldn't overlook it's fast hmm. 14 footer is going to be way faster than the 12 really yeah yep. why length so jeff could explain this better <laughs> but length length of wetted surface plays a lot to um to do with the speed i don't know it's, and then physics stuff yeah okay yeah, got math, it <laughs> math math i'm not good um but uh jeff has proven that with a lot of his speed and range testing videos um the for the longer the boat typically the 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 faster it'll go i think he had a 16 foot kayak one time that went like 7.8 miles an hour or something Damn. with the torpedo 1103 on it um and you know, it's just the, the, the length makes it faster. I don't know how it works, but it does. Mm -hmm. Um, the 14 footer is certainly faster than the 12. I can tell you that for sure. Cause I have both. And, um, yeah, I have Dude. a 14 foot Osprey down there and a 12 foot Osprey on the car. So do you are living the life? <laughs> well, I, I also am charged with testing these boats in this environment up here to make sure that they're worthy of him selling them. So but that's my job. My job is to test Trey's boats and try to break them. Anytime Trey makes something, he gives it to me to go try to break it. So and piss off Jeff. That's a pretty. That's a pretty good uh, job <laughs> description. <laughs> it, it works. I'm good at. It too. Um, but yeah, that's that's you know, if there's any one thing I want to promote, it's certainly that boat. Because and then well, we're going to link that in the episode description as well. Make sure you guys go give him some love there. I know I have a lot of Northern Virginia kayak guys. You know, if you're fishing a lot of these kayak tournaments, I know that there's a bronze back challenge that I'm supposed to be promoting. It'll probably be a commercial before this. Same thing. An inflatable kayak is the shit for, for small mouths and rivers. Ooh. It really is. Can I tell you one more thing? Yeah, go for it. This thing is awesome. This is such an awesome aspect of that I've fell in love with over the last two years. Smalley Games. Have you ever heard of Smalley Games? I have not. Okay. Smalley Games is a it's a it's a year long thing that's put on by Achigan, which is a brand of, um, they, they're doing clothing and stuff like that. Achigan is, I think technically one of the scientific names for smallmouth bass, I believe hmm. I think that's what it is, but either way, it's a, it's basically a year long celebration, um, shit talking about people who are catching smallmouth bass at the end. And we, the, the group is so freaking awesome. We got guys from all over up in the St. Lawrence river, out in mid, you know, the, the North, I guess, North middle section of the country, when you're talking about the great, the great lake regions and Wisconsin and Minnesota and all that, just from all over, people are going out and just 
catching smallmouth just to brag about them. That's it. Just That's to brag cool. about them. It's 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 a just a big celebration of smallmouth bass. And at the end of the year, if you play the game board, if you if you know you buy the stickers and everything, at the end of the year, you can be labeled as a bronze master, which that's cool in and of its own right. We have a separate group chat for that, but the celebration of the catch and release of giant smallmouth bass is probably the most exciting thing. And a lot of guys are catching big smallmouths. Is that a private group or is that a public? Um, Smalley Games is, I I think you have to like, you have to request to be approved, but you, anybody can go to their website and buy their game board and start playing Oh, okay, sweet. Then, yeah. So, also, guys, I'm going to link that in the episode description, too. So, if you're listening on Apple, Spotify, or you're on YouTube, you can click on that and kind of join that because that sounds that's awesome. It's so much fun. And we talk so much crap to each other. It's, Dude. yeah. Uh, there's there's so many things that you could do in this area when it comes to fishing and finding these communities that fit you is just so important. Yeah. Um, Jake, again, thank thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Again, guys, like and subscribe to the channel. It really helps in the algorithm. Uh, we're always in the top 200 podcasts in the world right now, which is insane. Um, but let's just keep the good times rolling. We'll see you next time fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts Thomas Aaron's and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.